Sally Ann Bowman had just turned 18. A singer and a model. She had her whole life in front of her. As soon as you could hear her voice in the house, it just brought a smile to your face and just the whole place was sort of full of sunshine. In the early hours of the 25th of September 2005, this life of promise was cruelly snatched away in a brutal knife attack just yards from Sally Ann's own front door. I've investigated nearly 30 murders. This is absolutely the most horrific one that I've investigated. The subsequent investigation into the killing would be the largest London had ever seen and would uncover a trail of attacks that stretched across the globe. The murder of Sally Ann Bowman was a crime that shook Britain. It's the evening of the 24th of September, 2005, in Croydon, Surrey. 18-year-old Sally Ann Bowman was celebrating a friend's birthday, partying in one of their favourite bars. Sally Ann had gone out with one of her sisters and some other friends into Croydon. And Sally Ann had spent most of the evening, up to the early hours, in Croydon Town Centre. She was picked up by Lewis Broston and he drove her back to Blenheim Crescent, which is where she lived. Lewis and Sally Ann's relationship had ended a few weeks before, and with emotions still running high, the couple began arguing in the car. This argument continued for over an hour and a half, until finally, Sally Ann got out of the car and Lewis drove off. It was probably around about quarter past four that Lewis drives away from Blenheim Crescent, looks in his rearview mirror, and apart from the actual murderer, was the last person to see Sally Ann alive. The events of the next few minutes will always remain a mystery. But what detectives were able to piece together was that Sally Ann, standing alone on her driveway, was subjected to a very sudden, very violent assault, less than 10 metres from her own front door. We know that Sally was stabbed at least seven times. Of those seven, three of them were so strong, a stab wound, that they passed through her body. Two went through her abdomen and out the back. She had been bitten uh, a number of times. There was a number of areas on her body, including the bite marks, that yielded DNA. We were also able to ascertain that Sally Ann had also been raped. And the evidence suggested that that had occurred after she had been killed. The events that led to the shocking crime committed in a quiet suburban street began almost 24 hours earlier. Sally Ann had spent the previous night at her mum's house and was looking forward to a relaxing weekend. Sally Ann had woken up and just laid about all day in her pink fluffy dressing gown, watching telly, munching on biscuits and crisps and God knows what. And then the phone went a couple of times. It was Sister Nicole asking if she'd like to go out for the evening as it was Nicole's best friend's birthday. It was about five past six in the evening on the Saturday the 24th and I went to the door and Sally just said, love you, Mum. I said, love you too. Um, it was the last time I saw her. Sally Ann met up with her sister and her friends and went to one of their favourite bars in the town centre to enjoy a girl's night out. When she was 18, she was an adult, just. Um, and she was very streetwise, so, I'd, you know, even if I had there probably wouldn't have been many concerns. Um, you wouldn't expect that uh, maybe the next few hours she'd be laying in a pool of her own blood, would you? I've seen the CCTV footage, she was at the bar, she was laughing, flicking her hair about, giggling, and according to Nicole, they had an absolute excellent night. And um, at the end of the night, she went back home with Nicole, but in the meantime of the journey, she was having a conversation with Lewis on the phone and got it into her head that she really wanted to see Lewis. So she arranged to go get a cab from Nicole's back into Croydon, where Lewis then went and picked her up. Sally Ann was in... Blenheim Crescent with her ex-boyfriend, Lewis Sproston, in, in a car outside of the address that she was living at, where she rented a room. And they're in that car probably from about half past two until at least quarter past four. What we know from a witness is that about quarter past four that Sunday morning, the witness woke up because they heard what they described as a garbled sound, which ended in a scream. Now, they looked out of their window, which looked onto the location that Sally Ann was... was 
eventually discovered, but couldn't see anything. It was very still, there was no other noise. They left their window, but returned about five minutes later, hadn't switched their bedroom lights on or anything like that, and they looked out and they saw a man walk down the street in the direction of where Sally Ann was eventually found. They then didn't see or hear anything else and they went back to bed. It's about half past six on the Sunday morning when a neighbour saw what they described as a, as a pair of mannequin legs sticking out from behind a builder's skip. They went over to have a look and discovered the, the body of Sally Ann, partially clothed um, and clearly dead at that point in time. As the murder squad assembled and began their initial investigations, detectives had to break the news to Sally Ann's family. I heard the door knock and I just assumed it would be Sally Ann. I was sort of panicking, thinking, oh God, the door's all locked up, she can't get in. And as I opened the door, there was a gentleman standing in the suit. Yes. Do you know Sally Ann Bowman? Yeah, she's my youngest daughter. Two female police officers in uniform. And sort of took back a bit and they asked me if I was Linda Bowman. And I said, I am. They said, do you know Sally Ann Bowman? And I said, yes, she's my youngest daughter. So you know Sally Ann Bowman? He didn't actually say to me, are you on your own? You know, I have some terrible news for you. Is there anyone you can have with you? He just uh, repeated the question again, do you know Sally Ann Bowman? And I said, look, I've told you, she's my youngest daughter. I said, what have they done now? Thinking, oh, the girls have been out, something's gone wrong. And he said, Linda, Sally Ann's dead, she's been stabbed to death. I just remember screaming, absolutely screaming. I just couldn't believe it and just my whole world fell apart. I just remember them, this look in their eyes where you just know there's something that's not quite right. And they said, oh, do you know Sally Ann Bowman? And me, I went, what's she done? No care in the world. Like, Ella was sitting on my lap, she was only little. And um, they said, uh, I'm really sorry to tell you, but Sally was found murdered this morning. And I remember at something leaving me that day. And it's never ever come back. I remember sitting there screaming and Ella sitting on my lap saying, Mummy, what's wrong? And I just said, Don't worry. Mummy's got something in her eye. And she said, I'll kiss it better, Mummy. I'll make it all better for you. But there's not anything in this world that will ever make it better because she'll never come back. Within hours of the murder inquiry being launched, the spotlight began to fall on one of the last people to see Sally Ann alive. Very quickly, we identified her ex-partner, Lewis Sproston, as someone who was a possible suspect. He was your typical teenage boy. You know, he went out to work, he worked. You know, he had a lot of respect for Sally Ann. They were the perfect couple. They were like the posh and becks of Sally, you know, Sally. Um, they had their moments, they were teenagers, they used to argue and bicker, but then who doesn't? Murder detectives um, were given the task of basically finding Lewis Broston that afternoon. They managed to find him with um, a brother and a friend of his. He was approached by police officers asking him if he was Lewis Broston. He said yes. And because he'd had a, a tiff with Sally that night and he'd driven off from the driveway, he said, oh, is this because we've had an argument? Immediately, alarm bells soon went off and they said, Lewis Boston, you are being uh, arrested for the murder of Sally Ann Bowman. And he had no idea. Here we had someone who had sort of acknowledged that he'd had some form of argument with Sally that night and literally put himself at the scene at the time of the murder. And there is only one way to manage someone like that with an investigation and that is to arrest them as a suspect for the murder. And that's what happened. Lewis Sproston was taken into custody and questioned for four days. During this time, his DNA was taken and the sample was sent for comparison with the DNA found on Sally's body. But when the results came in, the news wasn't what the police were expecting. It was a phone call from the Forensic Science Service which basically said, Stuart, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is if we have a match to the DNA profile from your crime scene. The bad news is it matches 
to another crime, another sexual assault, four years before, only a mile and a half away in, in Purley. This news ruled Lewis out as a suspect for Sally Ann's murder. But at the same time, the detectives' worst fears were realized. They were faced with a serial attacker, capable of murder, who could strike again at any time. Eighteen-year-old Sally Ann Bowman was found murdered just yards from her front door after a night out. She had recently moved out of the family home into her own flat, but still shared a close bond with her three sisters. The relationship Sally Ann had with her sisters was extremely close. Um, you know, there wasn't a day went by where she didn't see one of them and they didn't see her. Sally Ann was a talented singer who dreamt of performing at the Albert Hall and she also enjoyed a successful modelling career. Sally's modelling was her part-time job, something that she loved to do, always wanted to do from when she was little. Got the opportunity and took it with both hands, but that was just part of Sally. I don't know, they just portray her as the model Sally, wasn't her? Sally was Sally. Happy-go-lucky, always laughing, giggling, singing. She wanted the fairy tale. She wanted to work hard, you know, be able to support herself financially. She then wanted the home, then the marriage, then the children. She just had this little thing that she just wanted to be known. She wasn't didn't want to be this big celebrity or anything else, she just wanted to be known. And unfortunately now she's very known, but not in the way that she wanted. Within hours of the murder, the family faced the awful task of formally identifying Sally Ann's body. I went with Mum to go and identify Sally. I'll never forget, I just remember standing in the car park out the back and you can hear them wheeling, wheeling her through. And that thing just taking over, just wishing that it's not her. I remember going into the room and for that split second, for a split second, I thought it wasn't her because her hair was dark. And then I moved forward and you just see a little button nose and a little freckle. And that was it. Part of me didn't want to look. I could feel Michelle behind me and as I looked round, I just fell to pieces. My Sally laying there in a black zip-up body bag up to her neck. Um, hair all tied back of her head where her hair had sort of they'd washed the blood from her hair. Um, and I see a tiny wound to her neck. And Michelle was just screaming and crying, asking me to wake her up, please wake her up, Mum. And it's, sorry, it was, just, it, it was just horrendous. But all I could do was touch the glass. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere near my daughter. And all I wanted to do was hold her and kiss her, and, but we weren't allowed. Two days later, Linda Bowman and her family made the difficult decision to learn for themselves exactly what had happened to Sally Ann. Okay, so it was DCI Stuart Cundy at the time. Came to the house of the liaison officer and another police officer. And he sat down and said that he was now going to answer all the questions that we had. And our questions were, how did Sally die? And they explained that Sally Ann had 10 entry and exit wounds to her body where the blade of the knife was that long that it passed through her body completely. There were bite wounds to Sally Ann's body. And then he looked at, Stuart looked at Nicole and said, in reply to your question, Nicole, yes, Sally Ann was raped. I just remember Nicole screaming, kicking, shouting, um, trying to calm her down. And then the words were, after she was dead. That was just like a, a, someone hit me on the back of the head with a lump of wood. It's just pure disbelief that a human being could do that to a young girl that's laying dead on the floor. He took her last bit of dignity then. Early in the investigation, Sally Ann's ex-boyfriend was the prime suspect for the murder, but he was ruled out when his DNA didn't match the DNA found on Sally Ann's body. What scientists did discover, though, was a forensic link between Sally Ann's killer and an unsolved crime that had happened four years before the murder. 
The attack from 2001 was, was another truly horrific sexual assault on, on a woman. A lady who was in a phone box making a phone call when the suspect walks over to her, tries to get into the phone box and masturbates over the phone box. He manages to get the door open and then ejaculates over um, the floor of the phone box and then casually walks off across the car park of Tesco's away from her. That remained an, an unsolved police investigation despite the fact that DNA was obtained from, from that crime scene. And I say it's the, it's the dawning realisation that if the attacker has done that four years before and then four years later murdered Sally in a truly horrific way, what has he done in that intervening period? And if he, if he has brutally murdered Sally now, what might he do tonight? What might he do tomorrow? As the investigation continued, detectives were shocked by a report of another attack just yards from the murder scene, and only minutes before Sally Ann was killed. This was a lone woman who was um, standing in the street on a mobile phone when she describes a lone male walking towards her who literally says, I'm sorry, and then proceeds to hit her. And I, and I think undoubtedly this, this suspect would have had done more in an attack were it not for a taxi that drives down Sanderstead Road and probably disturbs him. What he does do before he runs off is he grabs the lady's mobile phone and she's still connected to the person that she was talking to. That person can hear the victim screaming in the background. But what is very frightening and very chilling is that the sounds of the screams don't get any quieter. Which suggests that 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 lady's attacker, which we maintain, well, I believe, was Sally's murderer, is then hiding somewhere very close by, watching what is going on. And that victim is then taken by the taxi driver and, and taken away to hospital. The victim from Sanderstead Road provided police with a detailed description of her attacker. And from this, detectives produced an e-fit of the offender, the same man who they were sure had also murdered Sally Ann less than an hour later. He's described as a white man in his 20s or 30s, between about 5 foot 9 and 6 foot. He's of proportionate build with short, dark hair. This e-fit was widely distributed, but despite the efforts of detectives and the number of calls from the public generated by the publicity, the breakthrough the police were desperate for never came. The murder squad went back to the DNA evidence found on Sally Ann's body to search for more clues. We recovered DNA from, from Sally's body. Everything suggested that this murderer was local. In my mind, he was either going to live locally or he was staying locally that night of the murder. So in consultation with Croydon community and others, I made a decision very early on in the investigation, that we would conduct an intelligence-led DNA screen. We had nearly 6,000 addresses that we wanted to ascertain every single male that lived in those premises or was there on the night of Sally's murder who might fit the description of her attacker. We anticipated that that was probably about 4,000 men of that description in the South Croydon area. So we took the innovative decision to basically set up a local DNA centre, which hadn't been done before, where we made the request of all the men in this locality to come to us to voluntarily give their DNA. We knew fully well that the killer was not going to walk in and volunteer his DNA, but what there is is this wider picture that may be his dad or brother, and there can be a link with the DNA down the line. We never expected the murderer would come down and give his DNA, because if they did, then undoubtedly they are literally handing themselves into the police. But it did allow us to, as quickly as we could, disprove the other 99.9% .9 of the population from South Croydon. Despite being able to rule out a large number of local men, six months after the murder, the investigation seemed to be stalling. The police had the killer's DNA, they had a description of their prime suspect, and they even had evidence of links to a previous attack. 
but they were still no closer to identifying him. There is an absolute fear, there is an absolute dread for, for, for many reasons. You have, you have this, this offender's, this murderer's DNA profile. You know he's a serial attacker. He has attacked two females within a close time period, in a close proximity. He has murdered one of those. Why isn't that individual on our database? How are we going to catch him? How can we quickly catch him before he attacks again? The murder of Sally Ann Bowman sent shockwaves through South London. An 18-year-old woman in the prime of her life, she was savagely stabbed to death just metres from her own front door. Detectives had recovered DNA of the killer from Sally Ann's body, and an attack on another woman just minutes before the murder had provided a description. But other than that, police had little to go on, and six months after the crime, Sally Ann's relatives were still living a nightmare. It was a not knowing who he was. It was a not knowing, you know, is he linked to the family in any way? Is it someone that we all know? Is it somebody we trusted? It was the fear of being in your homes at night, locking your windows, bolting your door, jumping every time there's a shadow or there's a noise. And from my point of view as a mum, is he going to get to another one of my girls? We had absolutely nothing other than DNA. That was all the police had was DNA. Faced with a stalling investigation, the police decided on a new line of inquiry. Just days after the killing, detectives had released an e-fit of the man who attacked a woman less than an hour before the murder. Police were sure that this attacker was the same man who would go on to kill Sally Ann. Now, though, they took the decision to release a second e-fit, this time of a man suspected of the attack in the phone box four years earlier. The victim of the attack in 2001 hadn't completed an EFIT at the time of her attack. I took the decision that actually she might be able to add something more to our investigation. Whilst undoubtedly this, the attacker and his image would still figure large in her mind, we could never be totally sure that the image which she created was indeed what the attacker looked like at that time. And if it was accurate, it was what he looked like four years before. But I took the choice, let's release it. We can use this to generate another round of significant publicity. So in March 2006, I released the second EFIT. After discussions with Sally Ann's family, the police also decided to release some of the more horrific details about the nature of the murder itself. It was absolutely imperative that everybody out there, particularly people in South Croydon, knew the level of dangerousness that this murderer posed. We did a television appeal and I remember thinking any minute he's going to say it and I could just feel my heart pounding. The decision was taken that I would tell the media and we would be publicly talking about the fact that Sally, we did believe that she was raped after she had been murdered. And um, that was it, it was all out there. Everybody knew. These revelations brought new leads but they too were dead ends. Police were still nowhere near catching Sally Ann's killer. All that was to change, however, with a seemingly unrelated event 20 miles away from the murder site, involving a 35-year-old local man called Mark Dixie. We believe Mark Dixie um, was at one of the local pubs in Crawley watching the, the England Trinidad and Tobago World Cup game. He'd clearly consumed some alcohol. He'd got in an argument with another male this argument spilled out onto the street and was seen by a police officer outside pushing this victim to the floor. Luckily for us, luckily for the murder inquiry, the officer reacted immediately and he was arrested and taken to Crawley Police Station. The officer that dealt with the investigation of the assault in Sussex was surprised how Mark Dixie behaved when they were in police custody, particularly when he was being interviewed. They described him as being quite tearful, which they were surprised about because it was a relatively minor case where he'd pushed somebody over. But they didn't quite know why, couldn't quite put their finger on it. Um, and once he'd you know, been interviewed, provided his DNA and, and his fingerprints, he was bailed from police custody. With hindsight looking back, he was probably tearful because this was the point in his life where literally everything came on top for him, and he knew full well that now his DNA had been taken, 
he would be linked directly to the murder of Sally Ann. Twelve days later, the murder squad received the news that would break the case wide open, confirming that the DNA found on Sally Ann matched that of Mark Dixie. We received an email from the, uh, the laboratory that we had actually a, uh, a DNA hit identifying uh, our offender, who we believed was our murderer. When the call comes in, setting aside that short-lived feeling of elation, the big question then presents itself, well, where is he? It would later emerge that Mark Dixie had fled to Amsterdam for three months in an effort to evade the manhunt. Luckily for detectives, an argument with his landlord meant Dixie returned to the UK in January 2006. Mark Dixie had gone back to his job uh, as a chef in a pub in Hawley, had still remained working there. Why? I'm not entirely sure, but I probably believe that Mark Dixie, uh, who was an arrogant individual, had got away with multiple offending throughout his life, had probably felt when he was bailed from Crawley Police Station that he had got away um, with the murder. When he was arrested for the pub fight, Mark Dixie had given the location of the pub where he worked as his home address. Armed with this information, detectives sprang into action. We didn't know much about Mark Dixie at this stage. Uh, we didn't know if he had any friends, whether he was likely to, to get assistance from anybody in the pub to, to, you know, to evade um, you know, our arrest. But at an early stage, we identified that he was working at that time in the kitchen. Police needed to get Mark Dixie out of this potentially dangerous environment. So they came up with a plan to get him away from the kitchen. It was whilst this plan was taking place, we were walking through the car park at the back of the pub, walking to one of the side entrances, and that is when we realised we've identified Mark Dixie, we've had his photograph, we knew what he looked like, and that's when we, we immediately arrested him. It was during that arrest I actually put my, my hand, you know, across his chest to make sure that he didn't run away. I could feel his heartbeat, and his heartbeat didn't even change. I had expected, you know, some form of reaction from him, uh, but I think it really just went to show what a, um, what a chilling, detached individual uh, Mark Dixie is. Dixie was charged with the murder the following day. The next move for the police was to inform Sally Ann's relatives of the breakthrough. The family liaison officer immediately went round to Linda's address. Um, it's not something we would ever want to do on the phone if we could avoid it, and therefore it was always going to be a personal message from the family liaison officer to Linda and her family. When I rang Linda out of the blue that night, which would have been about nine o'clock from memory, and said, I need to come and see you. She said, well, I said, Linda, I just need to come and see you. Um, and she said, oh, you've caught him. I said, Linda, I, I just need to come and see you. Please make sure you're available. And so I drove there, she opened the door, and she said, you've caught him, haven't you? And they said, just take a seat, just sit down. I went, you've got him. So I sat down, and I could feel myself trembling. And they said, yes, we have arrested someone. He said, I have the picture of the person that murdered, that we believe, you know, the suspect murdered Sally Ann. And he went to a picture there, and I had to stop him. I just hadn't... I wasn't ready. This side wanted to see it, but this side, I was petrified it was going to be someone I knew. After a few seconds, I composed myself, and I opened it. And just saw these big, ugly, bulging eyes and this horrible face, and... It was something I didn't know. It didn't make it any easier, to be honest. With the prime suspect locked up, detectives began the task of finding out exactly who Mark Dixie was and how he evaded the police for so long. Mark Dixie was, was born in 1970. He lived in Streatham uh, for a number of years before he moved to a children's home uh, in Sidcup. He'd been arrested by police for, for a number of uh, assaults, assaults on police, robbery offences. Um, but at an early stage, he went abroad. Through, throughout the years, he'd lived in Australia for a number of, number of years um, and had also moved to Europe, and in particular Spain, before moving back to, to this country. Crucially, all Mark Dixie's prior offences took place before offenders were required to provide a DNA sample. 
This allowed him to evade the attentions of the authorities for so long. He is a monster of an individual that has clearly led a double life. Uh, he's been able to submerge himself in normal society, pass himself off between friends and family as a normal individual. And I believe whilst he's been outside normal relationships, uh, has committed horrific offences, committed uh, attempted murders, sexual assaults, rapes of young females. We charged Mark Dixie on the 28th of June. Again, he gave no reply to um, when he was charged. In fact, the only thing he'd ever said was when he was first brought to the police station, when he was being booked into the custody sergeant, he made probably a throwaway but a telling comment, which was, I must have been mad to have done that. With Dixie in custody, the detective's job wasn't finished. In fact, it was just beginning. They would spend the next 18 months unravelling Mark Dixie's movements leading up to the murder to try and explain how and why he killed Sally Ann Bowman. Huge amounts of effort was put into tracking down his associates, his friends, to try and build a picture of who he was. The 24th of September is his birthday. He'd gone with friends to a pub in the Brighton Road, a few, you know, 100 yards from Blenheim Crescent, where, you know, as they often described him, he was often the life and soul of the party. Indeed, he was that night. He had a fair amount of drink, he'd taken some coke, but they didn't describe him as being overly intoxicated. One of the things which we were able to establish around Mark Dixie and his birthday was that birthdays were a significant event for him. And his partners described that he always expected, you know, something significant for his birthday. And on that day in 2005, his partner at that point in time hadn't gone out with him for his birthday. He spoke to her on the phone whilst he was in the pub with the others, and his associates, his acquaintances, do describe him coming back after that phone call as a different Mark. He was no longer that bubbly life and soul individual. He was a lot more subdued, potentially angry. Dixie spent the rest of the evening consuming a large amount of alcohol, as well as two lines of cocaine. At closing time, he left the pub with two female friends. He went back to stay at a friend's house to, to the women um, in, in Avondale Road, a few hundred yards from Blenheim Crescent. We think they went to bed probably in the early hours of the morning, and therefore at some point, probably from about half past two onwards, he leaves that flat and goes out. And what I believe happened is he took a knife from that flat with him. Whether it was one of his own knives, he was a chef, we just don't know. But I'm convinced he went out of that flat with the intention of finding a woman, attacking her and raping her. I think his first victim was the lady in Sanderstead Road. I think that he felt he'd failed with that attack because the taxi driver has disturbed them and he's had to run away. And that's when he's ended up in Blenheim Crescent. I think that has literally resulted in poor Sally being exactly at the wrong place at the wrong time. She would have been overpowered incredibly quickly. Mark Dixie has then savagely murdered her. He's then quickly left that murder scene, maybe only a matter of yards, we don't know, and has basically watched and waited to see if any of the neighbours have come out of the houses. No bedroom light goes on or anything like that. Of course, what he doesn't know is that there is a witness, one of the neighbours, who is looking out of their bedroom without the bedroom light on. And what she describes as a man walking down the pavement back to where Sally's body was eventually found, I'm absolutely convinced that is Mark Dixie. Assuming he wasn't being watched, Mark Dixie returned to Sally Ann's body and raped her. He clearly at some point then, once he's raped Sally, goes back to where he was staying that night in Avondale Road, goes to sleep on the sofa, and when he and his friends wake up in the morning, he behaves as if nothing has happened. And I think that really sums up in my mind what Mark Dixie is like, a callous nature and someone who has carried it off like this for most of his life. This cold-hearted detachment was never more evident than when Mark Dixie arrived at the Old Bailey 
on the 5th of February, 2008. His description of what he did the night of Sally Ann's murder would shock everyone who heard it. Detectives had spent nine months tracking down the man who murdered 18-year-old Sally Ann Bowman on her driveway in September 2005. She was stabbed seven times and, shockingly, she was raped after she had died. The prime suspect, Mark Dixie, was arrested after his DNA matched a sample found on Sally Ann's body. And as the trial approached, Sally Ann's family faced the awful moment when they were to see the killer in court. When we first went into the courtroom at the Old Bailey, the murderer was already in the box. And we were less than three foot away from him. And I could feel him staring round, looking round. Mark Dixie's defence was that he wasn't the murderer. There was another murderer still unarrested, undetected, but he was the rapist, that he came across what he believed was a drunk girl laying unconscious in the street on the driveway. Uh, and he thought he'd seize his opportunity um, to have sex with her. When he was telling this to the court and the jury, with Sally's family listening, it was delivered really with so much, and this is my phrase, so much contempt, as if to say, well, what's wrong with doing that? Throughout the trial, the cold-hearted Mark Dixie never once offered any explanation for why he had murdered Sally Ann. I remember watching him. With, he had no, no remorse on his face. He didn't care what he'd done. It was like it was pleasure for him to see that we were all sitting there hurting. He didn't care. He just wanted to see us squirm while we sat there and listened to what he had to say. He's just he's an animal. As part of their investigations into the murder in the lead-up to the trial, detectives began to uncover a trail of attacks that stretched across the globe. The trail led back to one man, Mark Dixie. We immediately realised that he had travelled to Australia. and We submitted again the DNA profile to Australia, saying that we identified our murder offender. Um, and it was Western Australia that came back to us uh, and said, yes, they have a hit for that DNA profile for an attack on a lone female in a house in Perth, Western Australia, in 1998. It was around about midnight. She was studying alone. When she heard a noise coming from the kitchen, she goes to investigate and sees what we know is Mark Dixie coming through the kitchen window with what looked like a stocking over his head, armed with a knife. And the next thing she knows, she's actually being stabbed. She's rendered unconscious. She receives seven stab wounds, very similar to that of Sally Ann. She was extremely lucky to live. And we know she's raped while she's unconscious, and a number of her personal items were stolen by Dixie, you know, which we believe were potentially used as trophies by him. The trial of Mark Dixie lasted three weeks, and the tension in the court before the verdict was delivered was unbearable. When the four person did stand up and they told the court that they found Mark Dixie guilty and it was a unanimous verdict. The feelings for each of us privately will all be quite personal and doubtless all different in many ways. From the police officer's perspectives, not a feeling but a myriad of feelings of, yeah, we got him. We got him. And I just thought, you know what? That's it, she can finally rest now um, that part of the journey's over he's been caught and he's been found guilty but it's not a relief because you can't have it back Mark Dixie was sentenced to mandatory life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 34 years for the murder of Sally Ann Bowman he is currently serving his sentence at Long Larton Prison in Worcestershire. He will be at the earliest in his 70s when he's released from prison, and that's the absolute earliest. It's a significant sentence. His, his dangerousness was acknowledged by the judge, um, and a sentence like that does reflect the need to protect 
society from Mark Dixie and individuals such as him. A prison sentence, however, no matter how long, was not enough for Sally Ann's relatives. Justice will never be done. Never. Not the whole time that man's living. It will never, ever be done. He's fine. He's got himself a nice little cell, cosied up in there. So what, what justice is that for Sally? She's not here. She's in a hole. She's not with her family, where she belongs. All because he felt that he had the right to take her from us. Mark Dixie is a detached, uh, arrogant monster who is a danger to the public. He's probably one of the most frightening individuals that I've had the opportunity to deal with in my police career. Do I have any feelings for Mark Dixie? If I'm honest, no, I don't. Mark Dixie is someone that I don't want to spend any energy having feelings about. My feelings are for those that he's affected throughout his life, Linda and her family, his other victims. Despite their misgivings about the sentence, the Bowman family have nothing but praise for the detectives who caught their daughter's killer, and in particular, their family liaison officer. Graham, our family liaison officer, could not fault him at all. He was more like part of the family. Absolutely amazing human being, and I can honestly say, if it wasn't for my family liaison officer, Graham, I wouldn't be here today. It, they're nice words to hear, and, and they're words you don't often hear from people. What it says to me is that I've done the best I can for that family. If Linda says that, then, then I know that you know, the Red Spot Police Service have given her everything we possibly can, and you know, it's, it's nice to hear those words. Due to the crucial role played by DNA in the case, Linda Bowman is now a firm advocate of a compulsory national DNA database. My reasons for sort of trying to campaign as such in my own little world for the National DNA Database, I don't see any deterrents even six years on that have been put in place. Politicians all have these bright ideas. Well, my deterrent is the biggest deterrent I could ever think of. Take DNA from birth. What's the problem with putting that onto a national database for everybody? DNA does protect the innocent because if DNA was not found on Sally Ann belonging to her killer, then Lewis would undoubtedly right now be serving a 34-year sentence for a murder. I think about Sally every five seconds of the day, seven days a week. I walk around the house and I look at the bedroom and, you know, I see her clothes, I've got some of her clothes hanging up my wardrobe, her pillows laying on my bed that I sleep with every night. You get that split second in the morning when you wake up and your life is perfect. Everything is how you want it to be. And then, bang, it's there and it hits you. Worrying to close your eyes, not knowing what you're going to see, not knowing if you're going to see that Sally that you remember or that Sally you see from the pictures. And that fear goes through me every night when I go to sleep. The nightmares don't ever stop. Just the ones where you just wanted to get to her, and there's nothing you can do. There's constant reminders, and there's days where I sit and think of her, and I have a huge smile on my face, and I think of some of the funny things and practical jokes she's played. And then there's days I just want to shut myself away from the whole world and pretend it's not happened and she's just having a long holiday. I think to myself, if she could talk to us, to me, her dad and her sister, she'd probably just say, Mum. I want my life back. Mum, I want to come home. But it's never going to happen, is it? The animal hasn't just taken Sally, but he's taken a piece of all of us. And he's taken a bigger piece from my mum, who were never meant, never meant 